What's good news for you? What's good news for me? Yeah. No news. When there's no news, that's good. Get it? I got it. All right, my friend. And good friend of Richard Belzer and myself, you know, Mr. Sure. Alan Zweibel. It's weird that Rick introduced me because I wanted to start off by, by talking about Belzer. Rick had a club. In the early 70s, I started going there on First Avenue between 76 and 77 called Catch a Rising Star. And um, I had a, I wanted to be a writer, and I had a, a manager at the time named Dave Jonas, who, um, back then was 111, so you can imagine. And he said, if you want to be with the kids, as opposed to the older guys that I was writing for in the Catskills, he said, you go to Catch a Rising Star, and he set me up with a guy there named Richard Belzer. I was 21, Belzer was about 52, 53 at the time. <laughs> And um, to know Richard Belzer then, he was the funniest guy in the world. Now you gotta understand, these were the days when young comics were starting out. Billy Crystal, Larry David, Jerry Seinfeld, Seinfeld, Robin Williams, Billy Boozler, okay, uh, Andy Kaufman. But Belzer was the one that everybody came and sat in the back and watched. He was the funny guy. And not only was he a funny guy, he was the nicest guy. He was the most generous guy in the world. To know Belza, and for him to like you, he would do anything in the world for you. And that validated you as a young comic. And we all appreciated it. And one of the reasons I wanted to do this tonight was to say, to say thank you to Belza. And we all showed our thanks to Richard. Um, as we all moved up and out, um, we always used Belzer in pilots and specials that we did, episodes of series, and just to show what kind of uh, regard he was held in. I mean, legend has it that when Robert De Niro was going to uh, study for the role of Rupert Pumpkin, he would hang out with Belzer, okay? Um, legend also has it that when B. Arthur was uh, trying to figure out her Maud character, she hung out with Belzer. <laughs> Bonnie Franklin, one day at a time. It was a beautiful thing. And um, Belza was the guy. And um, then, nothing for a while. He didn't, there was no justice. He go, wait a second. He's so funny. He's, he's the greatest. He, was, he could do an hour just on where you're from. Okay? There was no material. Yeah, he did uh, Mick Jagger on acid. Okay, but we saw that already. Okay, but he, he, he was just so quick and so funny, and we just couldn't figure out, okay, Richard's day would come, Richard's day would come, Richard's day would come, and then the motherfucker gets law and order. <laughs> and he, you can't get away from him now. He's on <laughs> Lieutenant Munch, he's on 40 times a day, on every repeat, and it could not have happened to a nicer guy. The irony being that um, you play a Jew, and you wear that hat sometimes, right? That fedora, which makes it look like you're, a, you know, a kitchen match with like a tambourine on it. You know? <laughs> that's the way that I look at it anyway. But the fact that Richard is uh, has written all of these books and his most current one, and I ran into him the other day here. I was with David Brenner. Bud Friedman, who owned a place called The Improvisation, was here. Rick Newman, like I said, owned Catch a Rising Star. Um, it was like Old Timers Day. Max Alexander, I think, was at your table as well. And it just brought back this flood of memories. And I asked Richard if I could uh, introduce him tonight because, seriously, I wanted to say thank you in front of all these people. Richard Bell. Uh, One of the finest writers in the business, Alan Zweibel. Boris Lewis, I don't know, I'm a Thank you. First of all, uh, don't worry, uh, those people that are worried about the election of Obama, don't worry. One debate does not an election make. 
Romney lied 27 times in 38 minutes. Uh, he did. And um, uh, I predict Obama will win by a much huger margin than everyone's saying. They're making it a horse race because of the 24-hour news cycle. But I promise you, virtually every woman in this country is going to vote for Obama. No, I'm kidding. 21 million single women didn't vote in 2008. And every Republican woman is going to hire their husband and vote for Obama because the political rights intrusion upon women's health has really, really tipped the scales. And uh, I think uh, the president will be reelected. And then when I go on Bill Maher, I'll criticize him, but not until then. Okay, now, for anyone who's worried, uh, the book, this book, and I've written a few books in my life. Uh, I've written a couple of novels and a comedy book that I wrote with. Uh, Rick Newman and I wrote, uh, what was my other book? Uh, Genesis, um, Moby Dick, I don't know if you heard of these, but um, War and Peace, but I don't want to throw names at you, um, Dublin and short stories, but um, I like the Irish. But this, this book I, I'm most proud of because it's in the history section, and I used to, I don't know if you, I don't know who knows this, but I used to be a journalist, I was a newspaper reporter. And if I wasn't in show business, I would be a journalist. And my partner, David Wayne, is a micro-analyst of the media and how it covers events. And we, we decided to pick 10 of uh, the most compelling cases, there are hundreds clearly, um, in our recent history where the official version was generally accepted and then over time people began to doubt the official story. And as time goes on in this country, as you all know, we question the government more and more, we distrust the news media more and more. Americans are very sophisticated and mature, and they can handle it, believe me. So um, this book deals with Marilyn Monroe's murder, and the reason I bring her up first is because um, it's the, I think, and we're pretty sure, it's the first book really to conclusively prove that Marilyn Monroe was in fact murdered, it wasn't a suicide, Kennedys did not murder her, they had nothing to do with it. Uh, Vince Foster was murdered, they said that was a suicide. Um, Robert Kennedy was not killed by Sirhan Sirhan um, because Sirhan had a, a pistol that had eight rounds in it and they took 14 bullets out of that pantry. Robert Kennedy was shot in the forehead. Sirhan was 10 feet away, couldn't have done it. Um, John Kennedy, of course, there, were more than, there was more than one shooter. But we, these things have kind of been around, but the reason uh, this book made the New York Times bestsellers, in my view, is because it's in the history section. I've been doing literally dozens of interviews. No one has refuted anything in the book. It's real reportage, there's forensic evidence. We interviewed FBI agents, police officers, uh, you name it. So uh, what we learned, what I've learned, is you don't have to make anything up. Reality is so complex and compelling and fascinating. It's like uh, each one of these is like a great murder mystery. And uh, I welcome any questions. I could go on for hours about any one of these, but if you have any questions, of course, I'll sign any books. And if anybody wants to give me any cash. Yes. I can, I can tell you some things about Maryland that are kind of uh, maybe not generally known or maybe hinted at in other books. Um, Bobby Kennedy visited Marilyn Monroe on August 4th. And uh, it's officially denied, but he was there because a police officer pulled over a car, and there was Robert Kennedy in LA that day. He left. He had nothing to do with it. Marilyn was murdered. The plotters did the murder to embarrass the Kennedys. They thought if Kennedy's girlfriend is found as a suicide, it would humiliate and embarrass the president. But the plotters didn't count on it. They didn't call the police for six hours. So they covered up, they cleaned up the scene. The first police officer on the scene said, this is a staged event. Because they said Marilyn took Nembutal. If you take Nembutal, you die before they're all digested, and you contort and you vomit. She was perfectly clean, lying straight in bed. The window in her bedroom was broken from the inside. She was on the phone with her friend. She said, I think I heard something. Hold on, never came back. They said she drank water to take these pills but her sink in her bathroom wasn't working. Uh, the autopsy showed there was nothing in her stomach because you, you die before all the pills are digested. So, um, and she, and then they, so the first person that was called was a studio PR person. Then two doctors, then Lawford, Peter Lawford came over, and they cleaned everything up. Now, the Kennedys, or at least Robert Kennedy, had to be involved in the cover-up because if it was revealed 
that he was there would have been humiliating, even though he, he didn't murder Maryland or the Kennedys didn't murder Maryland. So the plot backfired in terms of humiliating the Kennedys, but poor Maryland was murdered by an injectable enema, unfortunately, which is a famous CIA. Any other questions? Any other answers? Any prayers? JFK? Uh, well, I can just say that Lee, we know for a fact Lee Harvey Oswald did not fire a shot. Uh, he was eating lunch on the first floor of the depository at about 12.23. The murder was at 12.30. So you've seen on the first floor at 12.30, and we know that because uh, in the, the very little documentation we have of anything Oswald said, all the notes were destroyed from his interview, but there were some that survived. One of the inter interrogators asked him where he was. He said, I was having lunch. And he named two people that were in the lunchroom. Now, there's a lot of employees there. So for him to guess, he named, there were two black gentlemen. One's name was Junior. The other, Oswald didn't know his name, but said Junior was there with another fellow. Those two gentlemen testified they saw Oswald on the first floor. A woman who was pregnant and had to go to the bathroom like every 20 minutes. Um, that's not a slam, but so she was cognizant of time is the reason I bring it up. She was in the, in the lunchroom at about 12.23, 12.24 and saw Oswald. So that means if he did do it, at 12.24, he'd have to go up those four flights, but it's not really, I've been in the depository, so I retraced the steps. It's really eight floors. It's four stories, but with landings. You know, some, you go up and there's a landing and then more steps. So it's eight short flights. So he had to go up and go to the window and get this uh, supposedly Manlicher Carcano, which is an Italian rifle that was even a joke uh, in Italy. And uh, it had a misaligned scope, and he was supposed to have fired three shots in less than six seconds. Forget that there was a tree in the way. And, um, and then after he fired the three shots, by the way, the shells from the gun miraculously wound up in, like in a row right by the window. We won't get into that. All right, so then, all right, so Oswald, according to this theory, Oswald just shoots the president, and then he goes across the sixth floor and wedges the gun behind some boxes, and then goes down to the second floor and goes to a Coke machine and puts a coin in and has a Coke and is there out of, you know, calmly, not out of breath, when uh, a patrolman sees him. So now let me go back. The Warren Commission retraced the steps. They had an FBI agent do Oswald, and they had Officer Marion, who was a patrolman, who, uh, a former military man, was on his motorcycle going by the depository, heard shots, and a military man he knew it was either from the Dow Tex building or the depository, which is next to the Dow Tex building. So Officer Marion hears shots, parks his motorcycle, jumps off, runs up the first flight of stairs at the depository bumps into Roy Truly, who's the manager of the depository, and he says, follow me, because you know, the officer thinks the shot came from the roof of the building. So they run up the stairs, and there they see through a glass partition Lee Harvey Oswald with a Coke in his hand, calmly standing there, not out of breath, and the Coke was already open. And Roy Truly said, he's okay, he works here, and they, and they went off. I just I digress for a moment. You know how in the movies they, you know, the police come in, they go, nobody move. You know that's all. This cop said, everybody move. It was the weirdest thing. Anyway, you know he's okay. He works here. So all right. So now, according to the Warren Commission, that Oswald fired the shots and made it to the second floor in 90 to 95 seconds. Now this is important. These seconds. So I'm going to take you through this, seeing as you asked. Um, Okay, let's go back to the shots. Oswald's there, right? So in six seconds, he fires three shots. First of all, the first two shots came within less than two seconds, which is physically impossible for a man like a car cannon. But when you fire a bolt-action rifle, you sight it, but then you have to drop it to work the bolt and then resight. So in six seconds, you know, he does this miraculous thing, okay? Which, by the way, the best sharpshooter in the world tried to recreate that and couldn't do it. And Oswald was known as Shipper because he couldn't hit the side of a barn. At any rate, so let's say he, you know, he does that. Then they say he runs straight across the sixth floor of the depository. 
And any books that say Oswald acted alone, they always say that Oswald ran from the window straight across to this door and then went down to the second floor. But it's the book depository. He didn't run in a straight line. There were stacks of books all across the floor, which means he would have had to, it was like an obstacle course. Now, the reason I'm saying that is there's seconds involved here, right? So he has to dodge all these boxes. Then he supposedly wipes the rifle and jams it behind boxes. And, and the door to the stairway is really heavy. Not that I'm strong, but it, you know that's another second or two. And then go down the eight short flights. Then go pull another heavy door open. Then get the coat. And supposedly did that in 90, 95 seconds. Now, that's physically impossible to do. Because in the reenactment, they made the officer, Officer Marion, not run as fast as he did. They said he did it, I read the, the I'm crazy, I read a lot of the Foreign Commission. He said he did it at a kind of a trot, but he really ran. They, they did it twice. And they always kind of doctored his timing so that they could make sure that Oswald, you know. And the FBI agent who was playing Oswald, he went in a straight line across the floor, which is wrong, and just laid the rifle down on the ground. The rifle was found wedged behind boxes. So it would have been, it had to be like a minute, if it was real, that Oswald did that and then got to the second floor. So it's physically impossible. Another quick thing, um, you know, Oswald was arrested in a movie theater there are multiple witnesses who saw a man who looked just like him go out the back door of them. There were two Oswalds. Oswald was a fake defector. In the 50s, the Marine, the, our intelligence agencies, particularly ONI, but Marine okay. Intelligence, they recruited 18 or 19 American soldiers to pretend they were defectors and go to Russia to spy. But the Russians knew, knew about it, and they let Oswald in. They gave a job at the radio. You know, the Minsk uh, radio factory. He married a KGB colonel's daughter, was allowed back in the United States. Nobody questioned him. And he said that he was going to give up secrets and announce, you know, his government and uh, became a communist. He was not a communist. He was hanging out with Russian, white, uh, you know, white Russian fascists in the Southwest. And his uncle was in the mob. And, I mean, Oswald did not kill anybody. I believe, I mean, I'm certain, we know he was an, uh, a government operative. And we, we also know that he was a patsy and probably thought he was infiltrating the cabal and was going to expose the plot, but you saw what happened to him. Was that a little too wordy? Yes, sir. What about the fact Judy? Uh, officer, uh, yeah, Oswald did not shoot him because there, there were multiple witnesses that saw two men, one like, short with a, you know, Tippett was killed, uh, not certainly not by Oswald, not by the Oswald. So who actually killed JFK? Well, who did? Uh, the, the CIA was livid because he uh, fired the head of the CIA because they, the CIA and the Joint Chiefs misled him about the Bay of Pigs invasion. They said if you go in there, the Cuban people will rise up and it was a lie. Kennedy realized that he was betrayed. They were just kind of mugging him and he was a young, naive president. And he fired Dulles and he said, I'll cast the CIA into a thousand pieces. And he kind of grew up that day. So the CIA hated him. He also was going to end the Federal Reserve. He realized that the Federal Reserve really borrows money from private banks, so that America is literally owned by private interests. And John Kennedy, being a millionaire and not owned by anyone, lived in kind of a naive vacuum. And I don't mean that as a slam. He just wasn't owned by anyone. So he thought that the Federal Reserve is crazy. And he actually started using silver certificates to determine the value of the dollar and started printing money through the Treasury. He also wanted to skim the oil depletion allowance from all the oil billionaires who were making tons of money. And he wanted to take 1%, 2% off the top. They'd still be billionaires, but more money would be in the treasury. He had the first nuclear test ban treaty with the Russians, which appalled a lot of people in, the, in this country. He wanted to make peace. On the day he was shot, he had a Swiss diplomat sitting with Castro to try and straighten the mat out. Uh, he had Dr. King at the White House, so the White Citizens Council, those people, hated Kennedy because he had Dr. King at the White House. Cuban exiles hated him. The mob hated him. So uh, my, I, I, if you press me, when you're talking about banking, um, when you say you're going to end the Federal Reserve, that's going to cost banks over time trillions of dollars, not billions. That's a lot of money. And we all know that the CIA has front banks. And you know, 
I, there's no one big grand conspiracy in the world, but every once in a while, really dark forces come together and have a common interest. And Kennedy was just not doing what they wanted. So, uh, and we already had in, in place what they call executive action, a shooter team trained to kill Castro or other heads of state. And as they say in the research community, we just turned the guns around and killed our own head of state. It wasn't the government as an institution, it was elements within the government who did it, and then the rest of the government had to cover it up out of institutional embarrassment. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you can't keep secrets. You can't keep secrets, and people have confessed, and there's thousands of documents now, actually hundreds of thousands, that have been released over time through the Freedom of Information Act, plus eyewitnesses, testimony, it's just amazing, the ton of material, the doctored autopsy stuff. I mean, Kennedy was clearly shot by more than one weapon because the head the head shot his head exploded that was a frangible bullet the bullet in the stroke was was a different caliber so he was shot by more than one person oswald didn't fire a shot um elements within the government in cahoots with the darkest forces around said this guy's got to go and he went yes robert how are you robert klein one of the great comedians in the united states all English speakers come from I agree with you. I know I never liked the Kennedy story, but you never liked oh. Well, I mean, I, I yeah, it was fishy, I right? Was never feeling you were there when I was writing something. I, well, I was there when you argued with Arlen Specter. Oh, that's right. I, I thought you were going to hit him, but you know, I'm glad you were there. But George Burns. I mean, he really was on the grassy knoll. Well, he had enemies. <laughs> what? <laughs> Yes. He was in good health. Right. Yeah. Very, that's my next book, Dead Wrong 2. Or Dead Wrong Jew is the next book. <laughs> Sir. Uh, to, bolster, to bolster your argument. Yeah, I don't need any bolstering with me. Yeah, but thank you. Uh, to yes, that's a better word. Two of my This is important. Wait, wait. Warren Commission. By the Warren Commission, to do a study of how many shots they yeah. heard. Yes, sir. The what did they find? They found that there was more than one shooter. Yeah. That was the, wasn't that the Assassination Review Board in the 70s and not the Warren Commission? Sir. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. Okay. No, it wasn't. It was the, you're right, but it was the Assassination Review Board, not the Warren. The Warren Commission, uh, many witnesses were not called before the Warren Commission. Like the 128 people who ran up the knoll, none of them were called. People saw a gun smoke and smoke and fire. A guy who saw someone throw a rifle to someone and put it in a trunk and drive off. Many people were not called. The fix was in. We didn't want the world to think, don't forget it's the height of the Cold War. We didn't want the rest of the world to think we were banana republic. So people that weren't in on the crime had to cover it up. Yes. You already asked the question. We should be fucking good. Writing like this, are you with danger? I asked a friend of mine who's in the Secret Service. Uh, in 1999, when I was writing another book about Kennedy, if, because uh, some people were worried about it, uh, should I, they said, no, because you're a performer and they'll just make fun of you or marginalize you. Or, but uh, I'm a. <laughs> Also, yeah. Uh, I believe he had foreknowledge of the murder. I don't. Some people think he ordered it. I don't. I think he was told it was going to happen, and gladly went along. What's good news for you? What's good news for me? Yeah. No news. There's no news. That's good. Get it? I got it. All right, my friend.